Hello. Yes. Good morning. So you can hear me okay? All right. It is good. It's good to be with you guys. I'm excited. I'll be here again in a couple of weeks. And so to be able to worship with you and to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior is a good thing. Um, I've always been very grateful for this community and the way that you've come beside and around Route 1 and our work serving sexually exploited women right here in Springfield. Um, and so thank you, and thank you for inviting me in to share the word with you and to receive the word. Um, this morning, as I was looking at our text and preparing for our text, some things came to mind, and I asked the questions, what does it mean to be seen? What does it mean to be known? Do you value being seen? And I would bet for some of us here that it's easier to name a time when we were missed than a time when we were seen. I recently had lunch with Elizabeth, uh, and in that right before that lunch, a friend of mine had called me on the phone and said some things. She was talking about being in my apartment and kind of concerned because I had a pile of books in a wagon, and she was referring to it as clutter. Um, and this really hurt my feelings. It really made me feel missed because the wagon was my childhood wagon that my dad restored for me on my t for my 21st birthday, and the books were intentional. <laughs> she was like, don't you think you wanna get rid of the pile of books and maybe get some artwork? And I said to her, the books are my artwork. And so to feel missed, to feel unseen, um, can be a hurtful thing. But it's also a sweet moment when you are seen by a good friend or by your crush for the first time or your boss recognizes talents that you have that you've wanted them to have seen for a while to be seen despite yourself. And what I mean by that is before you are the great mom, leader, friend that you are, who are the people who saw you and saw the potential for you to step into those roles? I have a really good girlfriend. She uh, helped me launch Route One and launch it here in Springfield named Misty and she saw me as the leader I am today, even when I was far from that. And that is a beautiful thing. And so here's our point, is that my point this morning is that this is the heart of our text. The writer of John is the disciple John, and he has been seen by the true King of Israel, Jesus Christ. And he desperately wants his readers to know that Jesus is the true king of Israel. The writer is conveying to his first century readers to see Jesus as the true king of Israel, to see and know him as the one promised by the Messiah. And in addition to this point that the writer is conveying, there is a very sweet, tender story of Jesus calling his disciples. God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing to you. Amen. So as I studied this over the past week, what, what came to mind, what really struck me throughout reading this text and reading it in a variety of different translations um, is how many verbs and adjectives the author is using to convey the word seen or the idea of seen, being found, being known. While John, the author of our text, is 100% using this chapter to show that Jesus is the true king of Israel, John also knows what it means to be seen by the Messiah. In verse 43, right where our text picks up, it says Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And the Greek meaning of the word decided is to express 
one's will. Jesus decided caught my attention because it sounds human. It sounds fairly human. God is all-knowing, and Jesus is God. So how does Jesus decide to go to, to go to Galilee? Did he make a pro and con list? Did he weigh the better options? Did he think through his daily budget? He decided to go to Galilee with purpose. And we'll see in chapter 2 that the purpose of him being in Galilee, the region of Galilee, is to go to a very specific small town called Canaan, where he'll perform his first miracle, my favorite miracle, turning water into wine. I believe that Jesus decided to go to Galilee to find his disciples. And the true disciples of Jesus recognize him as king of Israel. In a few verses before our text, Jesus calls his very first disciples. If we were to back up and you could look at verses 35 to 42, you would see the story where Jesus calls Andrew and Peter, who happen to be brothers. And what's similar about this text to the one that we're in this morning is that Jesus calls one disciple, and then he goes and calls the next disciple. Because true disciples of Jesus recognize him as king of Israel, and they cannot keep it to themselves. Jesus found Philip. Our verse goes on to say, he found Philip and says, follow me. Is that Sound familiar? Follow me. The, the phrase, follow me. We're going to hear it over and over again throughout this gospel and if you were to read the other gospels. But this is the very first time that Jesus uses it. He uses it the very first time with Philip. Follow me. Because true disciples of Jesus recognize him as king of Israel. And the difference, there's a little bit of difference between when Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, and Peter and Jesus calls Philip and Nathaniel soon, right? And the difference here is that Jesus does all the work. If you were to back up, and I saw that Bob and Patrice opened their Bibles to back up and look at it, but if you were to back up and look at verses 35 through 42, which you can do now, you can do later, you'll see that they at least, for the very least, Andrew is a disciple of John the Baptist. Probably Peter as well. So Andrew and Peter are already seeking knowledge. They're already seeking new understanding of how to follow Yahweh. They've already submitted themselves to a rabbi. But when Jesus finds Philip, he says to him, he does all the work. Jesus found Philip. Jesus speaks first. Jesus employs Philip in a conversation because Jesus desires for Philip to know himself as a true disciple of Jesus, the true king of Israel. Philip, being so excited, realizing who Jesus is, finds Nathanael. And the word found in both places is the Greek word to discover, acquire, or win. Jesus won Philip, won him over. And Philip cannot uh, contain himself and wins Nathaniel over. Because a true disciple of Jesus tells their friends. The truth about Jesus as the true king cannot be contained. And the Jews would have been waiting for Jesus, for the Messiah, for a long time. Nathaniel and Philip clearly know each other, right? The scripture at least alludes to that because it would have said otherwise, and Philip found this guy on the road and talked to him. But he has a specific name in mind and a specific person. The Jews have been waiting and waiting and waiting thousands of years for the true Messiah. They've waited through slavery 
and exile, infringement, disobedience, and a regathering. And Jesus says to Philip, follow me. And Philip says yes and tells a friend. And it's not a clumsy type of telling. It's not like Philip and Andrew and Nathaniel are at the local pub and all of a sudden somebody brings up religion and then Philip crafts the conversation back over to Jesus. Philip is intentional about finding Nathaniel to tell him we have found him, the Messiah that has been promised. There was purpose in his finding. Philip discovers, acquires, and wins Nathaniel for Jesus. There, there's a clear friendship here. They've probably talked about this day, waited, discussed it, discussed why, what the Messiah, what muddy might look like. Um, but this is true. The true disciple of Jesus finds and tells their friends. And Philip goes and he finds Nathaniel and he uses their history, right? He talks about this is the Messiah that Moses discussed in the law. He uses their history. He uses the prophets. He uses any type of Jewish authority to convey to Nathaniel that Jesus is the real deal. He connects Jesus to Moses and their traditions, but he also brings it to present tense when he says that Jesus is the son of Joseph. That phrase would have been buzzing around, right? There would have been this couple that had a child out of wedlock, ugh, son of Joseph. So Philip here brings it full present, like not only is Jesus who Moses talked about in the law and the prophets discussed in the Torah, but he's here now. He is the son of Joseph. All of it pointing to Jesus being the Messiah. And the writer uses the word found again. We have found, discovered, acquired, and won the true Messiah. The writer John doesn't take a lot of time to unpack Jesus being the true Messiah. In eight little verses, he uses more than eight times phrases or references back to Israel and their heritage. The writer really wants to convey to his first century readers that Jesus is the true king of Israel. He refers to Nazareth and Bethsaida. He refers to Moses and the law, the prophets. Son of God is a reference here, which is a very Jewish phrase. He also references true Israelite, which takes us back to Psalm 32. Rabbi, which is a Hebrew term for teacher. So he's making all these connections. And he's making them very quickly, but they're quite deep, right? They're quite deep. Um, the writer does not stop. He further connects. He wants people to understand. He wants the readers of this first century letter to understand that these are not random people that are being selected to be disciples. He connects Philip to Andrew and Peter and, and Bethsaida, right? Family is pretty essential to the first century Judaism. And in fact, it's still fairly essential to Middle Eastern culture. Um, you need children in the first century to pass on your land. And you need land to pass on to your children. I had the privilege of going to Israel during my seminary degree, and I got to study abroad in Jerusalem for about five or six months, an entire semester. Um, and we did all this traveling up and down. Every morning we'd get up, or every weekend we'd get up, not every morning, sorry. Every weekend we'd get up at 5 a.m. and load into a bus and then travel to another part of Israel and hike around and look at the biblical lands of the Bible. And while I was in Israel, um, in Jerusalem at the school that I was staying at, there was a cook and his name was Benjamin. And he 
Well, I think he only knew like three recipes. I ate basically the same three things the whole year. Um, I also snuck in a little bit of peanut butter and jelly into my diet just to add variety. Um, but the truth is he had a son and I don't remember his son's name because he wasn't referred to by name. He was referred to as son of Benjamin because family heritage is that important in Israel culture. And so the writer clearly is drawing out his Jewish readers because he wants them to see Jesus as the true king of Israel and be true disciples. Nathaniel replies, can anything good come from, come from Nazareth? Now, Nazareth, that's also a hot ticket line that we hear lots of times. We've even, in the evangelical Christian world, made it into a joke. Can anything good come from fill in the blank with the city or whatever? But the truth is, Nazareth is only used four times in the entire New Testament. And so it was pondering to me as to why Nathaniel had such a problem with Nazareth. And there are some guesses, but one thing could simply be that Nazareth was a small rural town, right? A fishing community. And where Nathaniel is from, Canaan, which will, the text will tell us in chapter two that Nathaniel's from Canaan, is also a small town. So there could be some jealousy. There could be this sense of, well, I'm from a small town. Why does the Messiah come from another small town and not my small town? Maybe there's even some projection of shame, right? If you are from a small town or a town with not a lot of economic means, people tend to shame you. And maybe Nathaniel has been shamed. And so he's projecting some of that shame back onto this statement that Jesus is from Nazareth, the Messiah is from Nazareth. And I just kind of interrupt myself here because what struck me is that other people may shame Nathaniel from being from Canaan or Jesus from being from Nazareth, but God has not shamed either of them. Neither is their heritage or background or ethnicity or economic standing um, worrisome or surprising to God, right? And so I say that to myself and to this room in the places where you've been shamed because of your ethnicity, the color of your skin, the town that you're from, know that that is not a matter to God Almighty, that he still calls to you and desires for you to be seen by him. Well, Philip is not dissuaded. So Nathaniel has his smart comment and Philip says, come and see, come and see. Philip is so certain of who Jesus is that he does not need to stop or debate with Nathaniel about the value of Nazareth and the people who come from there. He simply says, come and see. He invites him to meet Jesus because true disciples of Jesus recognize him as king of Israel. Come and see. Here again, I did a little bit of a deep dive, and I found that the word see is found in the imperative form, and it better translates behold, which should tap us on the shoulder and remind us of a text just a little earlier in this chapter, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This clearly directs us and the first century reader back to verse 29. Come and see, we have found him, the Messiah. Nathaniel goes, despite his skepticism and his doubt, he is driven by something deeper, which is hope. Nathaniel has more hope that the Messiah has come than he does doubt that anything good could come from Nazareth. Martin Luther said that doubt is the beginning of faith. Jesus speaks to Nathanael as he's coming. There's a lot of energy in this text. Jesus can't wait 
for Nathaniel even to get to him, that he starts, the text says, speaking to him as he's coming, because he desires for Nathaniel to be seen as a disciple. Jesus doesn't wait. He says, look, a true Israelite indeed. And Nathaniel engages, how do you know me? How do you know me? And uh, because I pause here, because I see that the Nathaniel is quite literal, right? Like he wants, he's quite literal. My brother is very literal. And sometimes as we're working out problem solving, he will, so I might say, say for example, if we're planning a trip, I might slip and say, okay, yeah, well the hotel called and blah, blah, blah. But if what we've booked is an Airbnb, Arthur will interrupt me and say, you mean the Airbnb? Well, of course I mean the Airbnb. Um, and I pointed this out to him at one point in frustration. I'm like, can you please stop? Like, you know what I'm saying. And he's like, yeah, yeah, my wife says the same thing. Um, and so in that moment, and he goes on to say, that's just who I am. My brother went on to say, that's just who I am. And I felt this heaviness because I had missed him, right? And now there's an opportunity to see me, to see him. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. And Jesus replies in verse 50, before Philip called you under the fig tree, I saw you. And as I read that text, it gets me every time, which is per kind of why I picked it, to dig in a little deeper. Jesus saw Nathanael before he is good, before he is redeemed, before he is a disciple. Jesus saw Nathanael and knew him when he saw him under the fig tree. Before Nathanael sees Jesus, Jesus sees him. And this is true for each one of us. Jesus saw us under the fig tree before we saw him, whatever that might look like for you. Another writer puts it this way, he knitted us together in our mother's womb. Another writer says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The text ends with Jesus declaring how he will leave this earth the first time with angels ascending and descending. And Nathaniel believes. What is interesting to me, just this last bit of the text, is where Jesus says to Nathaniel, because I said to you, you under the fig tree, you believed, that you is in a singular form. He's speaking specifically to Nathaniel. But when we get to the last verse of this chapter, when he says, you will see heaven open and angels, that is in the plural. Jesus is saying that to all his disciples. True disciples believe Jesus as the king and tell their friends. And so I just end with this application is, do you know Jesus sees you? Do you believe that he saw you under the fig tree? Jesus sees you more clearly than your spouse of 25 years. Jesus sees you more clearly than the boss who just gave you a promotion. Jesus sees you more clearly than your sibling of 43 years. Jesus sees you and desires for you to see him. And if this is true, can you also go tell a friend? Let's pray. <sighs> God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, triune Lord, once again, I am humbled at what you teach me through your text through your written word. Thank you for writing it down. Thank you for preserving it for thousands of years. Thank you that we have scripture in our language that we can read and have read to us. 
God, I pray that you would stir in each one of our hearts throughout today, that we would think of one person that we can share you with and that we would bravely do so. I also pray for us as we are hurting that other humans will definitely miss us this week, that you would remind us that before we saw you, you saw us. God, I thank you for this opportunity to be here today. Jesus, I do. I thank you for today. Be with each and every one of us. May your name be praised.